Happy Easter. My name is Dan and I'm one of the pastors here at Mercer Creek Church. And we are so glad that you've chosen to join us for Mercer Creek's online Easter celebration. You might be new to this whole online church thing and that's that's quite okay. It's new for a lot of us. I know I personally have enjoyed being able to kind of tune in for church in my living room, in my pajamas. Uh, but hey, if you are joining us in your pajamas today, or even if you're joining us from your bed today, no judgment whatsoever. We want you to make yourself at home. Maybe you got dressed up like me today. It's the first time I've worn a collar shirt in well over a week, uh, but, but that's okay. This is an important day as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We celebrate that our God is alive, that he would not stay dead. We celebrate that Jesus Christ has risen. Uh, he's risen indeed. So that's, that's what we've come to celebrate today and welcome to you no matter where you join us from. Uh, we are going to be together for a, a, just a, under an hour. We're going to sing a few songs together. Uh, feel free to enter in however you're most comfortable. You might want to stand up. You might want to sing along. But more than anything, we want you to join us as we worship today. Then uh, in a little bit, I'll come back up, tell you about some different things happening here at Mercer Creek. And then our pastor, Pastor Todd, is going to come and share the the story of resurrection, the story of Jesus. But today as we enter into worship, I would just remind you that we celebrate a, something pretty significant today. We celebrate that Jesus, the Savior of the world, stepped down into darkness and brought his light. He lived, he taught, he would later go to the cross, which we just celebrated and, and remembered on Good Friday, and he died. A brutal death for the sins of the world, for you and for me. But, but you see, our Jesus would not stay dead. Our Jesus would rise from the grave on Easter Sunday, which is what we celebrate today. We celebrate that our Jesus could not stay dead, but that he is alive, that he's conquered sin, that he's conquered death, and that is something to celebrate. So would you sing with us now as we raise our hallelujah to our Jesus who is alive. Yes, Lord. Let's go ahead and lift our voices together. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a i 
Jesus. Thank you for all that you're doing here. truly here with us, Lord God, right here, right now. Thank you that you're everywhere. Jesus is in this room, here right now, here right now. He's making this place
right here, Lord Jesus, that you see us.
Let's pray. God, you are so good. Uh, and we just praise you today for your faithfulness. We praise you for uh, your graciousness. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for coming to bring us life. And I just pray today that you would remind us afresh of the hope that we have in you. Help us to be able to, to trust you when we're filled with worries and fears and doubts. And help us, God, to walk in your life, to walk in your, your, your hope today. So God, come and speak, come and move today, we pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, we wanna continue right now in giving our tithes and our offerings back to God. This is, we do each week as an act of worship. It's something we do each week as an act of trust, as we are reminded that everything we have is a gift from God. And man, in a season like this of uncertainty and, and fears, and uh, it, it's an amazing step that you and I take as we uh, give our best back to God first and foremost. So thank you so much for your generosity today. I do wanna just say too that um, as you have been giving faithfully to Mercer Creek, you are helping to advance the gospel right here in our valley and beyond. And it's been cool to see all of our, our ministries uh, continue to function, continue to serve, continue to love well. Uh, I, I could tell you story after story, but I don't have time. Uh, but I will say that uh, we've seen some cool stuff with our youth ministries, with our college ministries. These ministries are still able to gather and, 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 and point people to Jesus in the midst of all of this shelter in place stuff. Isn't, isn't that so cool? Even a bunch of our small groups are still able to gather over um, you know, Zoom platforms and whatnot. So uh, more than anything, I want you to hear from me today. Thank you for your generosity and thank you for helping to continue to advance uh, the gospel of Christ right here, right now in the midst of a crisis. If you'd like to give and continue to be a part of these things, you can go to our website, mercercreek.org backslash give. You can use our mobile app uh, and you can even even mail in a check the old-fashioned way to us here at Mercer Creek. So thank you for that. Well, one of the things that we do want to do as a church is we want to be on the front lines of the needs in our community right now. We're doing that with uh, many of our strategic partners uh, currently, but we also want to do that in a one-on-one in -on -one basis. So if you or one of your neighbors has a specific need, we want to invite you to go online to our website today or in the days ahead. You'll find a tab there to, to share what that need is. Maybe you have a prayer request, you'll find a tab there to share that prayer request. And it may be that you're in a place where you can be serving and helping meet some of these needs. So th there's a tab there as well. And, and just know all of these things will be on our website. Uh, another thing that might be interesting to you for, for kids after the service today, maybe you want to go watch our kids Easter service. You're going to find that under the Mercer Creek Kids tab, uh, which will be uh, on, on the student ministry stuff. So something for everyone on our website. Well, over the last couple, uh, last couple weeks, we've been in a series going through the gospel of John. And we've been looking at the, the different miracles, the different signs, that, uh, that, that, that point to who Jesus is. And if you missed any one of those weeks, you can obviously go and watch one of the videos after the service today. Uh, but right now, we're going to show you just kind of a little recap video highlighting all of these different, di different truths that we've been learning in this series. And then Pastor Todd will come. Who is this man? The best is past, but his ways are more. Revealed authority we've never witnessed before, yet the transformation was sweet. He knew. He always knew what we needed. It wasn't his time, but we believed for this reason. Turned water to wine, but the grapes weren't in season. The first of many, but in the moment it was only, only him. There's no other with such glory, so with hope I pray you believe this testimony. This wasn't magic, it was holy. is this man? My son is sick on the verge of death. Lord, come quick before he breathes his last breath. Yet he asked if I wouldn't believe if I didn't see his wonder. I averted the question. I was desperate in need of a savior. With authority, he told me my son would live. So I took his word, went back to my son, and by the glory of him, my son was not dead. In that moment, I knew this man would save more than my son. My family believed. 
the Son of Man spoke truth. Where did he go? My whole life I was told I'm a sinner, paralyzed, paying for the sins of my fathers, until you came and gracefully put me in the water. The leaders objected, but you made me elected, for I'm not bounded by the sins of my fathers, for now I may no longer sin for the sake of the caller. He gave strength in my knees. My heart believes this man is more than a man. He's a king. I'm just a boy that doesn't have enough. I see so many hungry, so what I have, I give up. This man before me takes the bread, gives thanks to God, and before my eyes they spread. Not only did we have enough, but we had more than we could have asked for. No question, no doubt, this man was the one. The people wanted him to be their king, but only the man knew what they needed. It wasn't his time. Why did he go away after the people wanted to crown him our king? Is this not what he wanted? For us to declare him our savior? Oh, how little of faith I had when the wind blew. The waves crashed with anger, yet his peaceful steps made them soothe. For we were afraid until we heard his voice. The authority of the creator, his words filled the void. Our lives are safe with him. We rejoiced. Is my sight the result of the sins of my lineage? Or am I cursed from my own ways having no vision? Suddenly I feel the presence of someone more than man rub dirt with saliva in my eyes with his own hands. My flesh wanted to flee in terror, but my soul was calm. He said, go wash yourself in the pool of Salaam. So I did, but when I came back I saw. He was no longer in sight, but he left the mark of God revealed in my eyes. My heart aches, my soul mourns with my brother, for if Christ were here, death would not bother. But death has made itself known, that four days ago, behind that stone, my brother lay flesh alone. In authority he spoke, come forth, and breathed life to dead bones. But what we didn't know, was the glory of him was greater than death, that my brother was only at rest, that my faith was only at test, that even Jesus had wept so the power of God would be revealed again and again, so that those could witness before the time comes that would look like the end, when in all, he's just getting started. This is only the beginning. Good morning, Mercer Creek. Welcome to Easter. <laughs> Can't believe this is Easter. Social distancing Easter from the King household. So I'm so glad to be able to have this moment with you in your living room. Uh, one thing I want to ask, though, as we get started, would you be willing with me to just start by praying? And here's the prayer I want to ask everybody. Would you be willing to just kind of, I don't know how I say this. It, it, it's not that it's not true. It's not that, but it's just kind of suspending COVID-19 for just a few minutes. That although that's been the first thing and the priority on our minds as we're quarantined and having to deal with all the changes, I want to ask that for the next, you know, 20, 30 minutes, we just allow this time to be a sacred space that we get to focus on really the most important thing of all, even though it feels like our world may be falling apart a little bit. So let me pray and ask that God would bring our hearts just to this moment so that we can focus on him. Pray with me, will you? God of the universe, thank you so much that you love us. Thank you that you see us, that you hear us, that you care about us, that you want what's best for us. And Lord, as we are engaging this sacred holiday, the best of all the Christian holidays, the biggest, the most important, would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear how good Jesus is? And Lord, let nothing else even get in the way. I ask all of this in his name. Amen. I, ha I have some Christian uh, 
uh, friends from pastors who struggle each year at Easter because they're like, oh, I gotta preach the same thing again. And I gotta laugh at them. I'm like, guys, this is the best thing to preach about that there can possibly be. Easter is like the best holiday. And so I'm privileged to be able to come before you today and be able to talk about Jesus and talk about the resurrection. Uh, and, and one of the things that I think we, we, we have to understand that Easter does more than anything else, it answers the questions around who is Jesus. Now, it'd be easy for us as Christians today because we have the privilege of looking back. We go, well, you know, we, we know who Jesus is because the Bible says so. But I think it's more important than that. It's actually more specific than that. We actually get to say what we say because of eyewitness accounts. We say, hey, we know who Jesus is because Mark told us so. He's the first of the four gospel writers, and he, he wrote a book. And this was a guy who was, I'm sorry, Matthew. He was touched. He was touched by Jesus. His life was transformed. Then there was Mark. And he, same thing, Mark told us so. And then there was Dr. Luke, and then Dr. Luke told us so. And then there's John, who we're actually going to be in today. We're going to be reading some of John. John lived, he was the youngest of Jesus' disciples, and he lived to old age, only one of the disciples to do so. And at the end of his life, he wrote and told us all about Jesus. And then there was even Jesus' brother, James, he wrote and told us about Jesus. And there was this guy, Paul, who had this radical encounter with Jesus, and his life was transformed and turned upside down. And he, he wrote half the books in the New Testament, and he was telling us who Jesus is. And so, again, I, I think Easter is much bigger than, hey, just the Bible tells us so. It's actually, no, because of what they saw, we get to hear. And when we hear, we get to believe. And that's the point of all these writers. They want to teach us who Jesus is so that we can believe in him. Well, if you haven't been with us for a while, we've been walking through the book of John. And in fact, I want to encourage you right now, if you have a Bible, would you turn to the book of John? We're going to be in chapter 19. Now, as you're doing that, let me catch you up in the story where we've been. Uh, just last week, we were talking about this incredible thing that happened where Jesus raised a man from the dead. It was this sign of who he was. And as a result of that sign, many Jews came to believe in him. They were so excited about it that they, they just wanted to crown him king. They were excited. Oh man, this, I can't believe it. Here's the savior. Here's this anointed one. He's so special. But at the same time, there was also some religious leaders in that day who were upset because their God box was so small. They're like, no, 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 this can't possibly be the right guy. And so they put a plan in place to make sure and see that Jesus would be killed. Well, what happens is Jesus eventually goes back to the big city and one of his followers um, ends up betraying him. He gets handed over to the chief priest and of course they have false claims against him. Then he gets handed over to Pilate and Pilate, okay, I don't understand this whole thing. He goes, let me beat him with, to it within an inch of his life. And he does. He goes, well, that's enough, right? They're like, no, that's not enough. We've got to kill him. And so they rallied the crowds and they you know, crucify him, crucify him. And, and so Jesus was hauled off with two criminals and he went to a place called the Skull where he was uh, on a cross, hung to die between these two thieves. Well, it, it's during that story, there's actually this fantastic thing that happens where Jesus' uh, mother Mary was there. And in the story of John, uh, we read that uh, Jesus said to John, hey, John, I mean, think about this. He's on this ancient torture instrument, which a, a, uh, effectively makes you asphyxiate. It makes you hard to breathe over time. And in, with the labored breaths, he says to John, hey, John, take care of my mother. She's now your mother. She's yours. And I mean, it was an amazing thing to see this son who at this worst moment in, in his whole life thought of his mother. I mean, this I mean, again, tells us total about who Jesus is. And as he continues through this, we see what happens in this crucifixion and how difficult and horrible it was. But what was fascinating is after Jesus said it is finished and he died. And again, that's what we remembered on Good Friday. We see that John, almost as if he's reaching out through history, and he's, I mean, he's talking about the death of Jesus at this point. He pauses, and it's as if he's writing to us at this point, saying, hey, guys, I want you to pay attention. This is found in John 19. He says, 1935, says, the man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. And again, he's talking about himself. He knows that he tells you the truth, and he testifies now listen to why John says this. He testifies so that you also may believe. That you also may believe. 
That, that's the point. I mean, John wrote this in to the death narrative of Jesus. He wrote this, hey, the reason I'm giving you all these details is that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Well, at this point, you can imagine the disciples' whole world is turned upside down. Their rabbi, their teacher, the wisest person they'd ever been around is dead. They'd watched him do all these miracles, all these signs. They'd listened to him teach. They had felt and experienced an incredible reality with him. It was unlike anything else they'd ever experienced. And, and all of a sudden, he's not with them anymore. I imagine it was like a stab to the heart, like, like all the grief that you've ever experienced rolled into one very singular moment. But yet, there was good news coming because Sunday was just around the corner. Again, if you have a Bible open, we're going to start in the very first verse of chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, Hey, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. And you can imagine Mary, I mean, she's kind of freaked out. It's like, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. He should be here. Did somebody rob his body? What's going on? Maybe one of the guys knows. So she goes to two of Jesus' followers, Peter and John. And John refers to himself as the disciple Jesus loves. I don't know if that's a term of affection or if he's doing a humble brag here. But again, that's how he's referring, kind of in the third person. And they hear that. And he and Peter, of course, they hear this like, oh, we want to find out what's going on. So they take off to go to the tomb. So Peter... And the other disciple, again, that's John referring to himself, started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Now, you gotta, you got to love this fact. Here's old man John writing about this story. And as he's remembering the story between him and Peter, he talks about how he outran Peter in a foot race. i, I got to love that detail in the scripture. Now, it says then he bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. And I, and I have to ask myself, well, why didn't he go in? And I, and I wonder if for John at this point, he was a little scared. Probably it's dark inside the cave. He wasn't really sure what was going on. But Peter is very different. If you remember the stories of Peter in the Bible, Peter's an impulsive type. He, he doesn't pause at all. Watch what happens. Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, again, that little humble brag, he, by the way, remember, I was the one who run, won in the foot race. Uh, he also went inside. He saw, now this is so important, he saw and believed. He saw and believed. Now here's the crazy thing. They saw and they believed. And then the next sentence that's put in parentheses in the scripture says, they still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. They still didn't have all the clues. They still weren't fully aware what was going on with Jesus. But because of what they saw, they believed. Hmm. It's amazing. Well, as as this story unfolds and they discover, hey, Jesus isn't there, Jesus ends up appearing to Mary. And you might remember the story of Jesus appearing to Mary and comforting her. He's incredible what he does and how he connects with her. But I want to go down to the portion where he appears to all his disciples, because I think there's a huge takeaway here that I want to talk about and celebrate this Easter. Verse 19, just jump down a few verses. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked in fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after, the, after he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. His disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. C can you imagine how you've had an enormous um, kind of turn of feelings? Where on Friday after his died, you thought, wait, wait, what's going on? Everything we had hoped for is lost. But then all of a sudden, here it is Sunday and everything's changed. You see the wounds in his wrists and, and, the, and, and, the, and the hole in his side. And you realize, wait a minute, this is exactly Jesus who died. And yet now he's raised from the dead. I think that phrase, I love what it says. And, and then they were overjoyed. They, there could be no other word. This was amazing. 
They got to experience something that they couldn't believe is possible, that a man who had died could raise himself from the dead. They're, they're, he just, they had no category for this. They were overjoyed. Hmm. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. At this point, I think this is so important for us to realize, Jesus gave the disciples their marching orders. And I think these two elements could be true still today of the church, that there is power in the Holy Spirit and the currency of God's kingdom is forgiveness. That still today, God longs for us to be in step with the power of the Holy Spirit, that God has sent us a comforter and a support and a teacher and a guide, the Holy Spirit, the living God himself in spirit form. And at the same time, we realize that what God longs for all of us to be about as followers of him is to be people of forgiveness, that we let go of the things that keep us apart and we forgive one another, that we move towards one another in tremendous love. I, I love the beauty of what Jesus did in that moment. And there's just few, just this few short words. He gives us incredible marching orders. And I believe, again, that this is something that's good for us today. Now, he, he appears to Thomas and that is an incredible story. But I want to jump down and, and go to the very kind of end of this chapter and read a statement, which I've said before, is the summary statement of this whole book. That what John has been leading up to in this whole book is found in verse 30. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I, I, I love the beauty of what this is saying to us right here. Again, John wrote this whole thing. He wanted us to experience and see who Jesus was. He wanted us to see the miracles he did. He wanted us to show what the signs pointed towards so that we as human beings, could look, look what he says, two things, that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the savior of the world, and that by believing we could have life in his name. That, that, that's, that's what we're celebrating here on Easter, that we can have life in the name of Jesus. And, 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 and I, why I think that way about this is there is tremendous power in what happened is in the resurrection. I want you to think about this. If Jesus could defeat death, then he could defeat absolutely anything. Anything, absolutely anything. And for me personally, that gives me tremendous hope and honestly, I've witnessed this over and over again. Perhaps what has hit me most recently is the fact that three weeks ago was the 10th anniversary of my brother's passing. He died uh, 10 years ago uh, from cancer. And I'll never forget that 10 years ago when my brother um, contracted cancer. We found out on Christmas, and it was a horrible time to find out somebody has cancer. And then just a few weeks later, on my wife's birthday, on, on January 16th, um, he had to go in for a surgery. And the hope was with the surgeons, hey, it looks like he has this cancer all around his kidney. It's metastasized there, and hopefully we can go in and just grab that out, and, and it'll be done. That, that three-hour surgery ended up being a 10-hour surgery. And what they discovered is the cancer had kind of spread all over his organs and it metastasized kind of everywhere, and it was essentially a, a death sentence. I, I remember when my brother got out of uh, that surgery, and he was in the recovery room. And I was alone with him in there and he looked at me and I, I couldn't believe how lucid he was at this point, but he looked at me and said, and you could almost see the desperation in his eyes. He, he goes, Todd, tell me about the father's love. Tell me about that. Now, what you have to understand about my brother is my brother grew up in a Christian house and my dad's a pastor. Many of you know that. He had heard all the Bible verses. He had learned all the stories. He had memorized a ton of the verses. But my brother lived the life that my brother wanted to live and not the life God wanted him to live 
and it was, it was very different. I remember my brother had all the toys. He, he, he had the big house. He, he had the fancy car. He, he had the motorcycle. He, he had the yacht. He got to go on any vacation he wanted. He wanted, he could have any toy he wanted to have. My brother had all this stuff. Many people looked at him and said, oh wow, he has the perfect life. He could do whatever he wanted. But I remember my brother secretly saying to me a couple of times, I, I wish I had your life, the, the family you have, the type of life you have. And, and my brother was agonizing because he tried to pursue life on his own. And what he discovered is that wasn't the life that was he was designed for. And I remember after this period in January and February, March, and my brother was basically told, hey, you have three, three to six months to live. He only made it two. But in those two months, we saw incredible, radical change because my brother encountered the power of the resurrection in his own life. I'll never forget one time he was he was with my wife and he was asking her, you know, Karen, why are you so nice to me? Because my brother had been, quite honestly, he'd been cruel at times and racist and he had just said some horrible things to her. And my wife was caretaking for him in ways that, I mean, she was just such a servant. And he was like, Karen, why would you do this? And, and she just simply looked at him and said one word. She goes, Greg, it's grace. It's grace. And they got to have these conversations about how the love of God is so rich and good and pure and holy and awesome that God has done everything because he wants his people to come towards him. I remember when my, my brother had to confess to his business partner, because again, grace started changing his life. He had to confess to his business partner, Bob, how he had swindled him out of money. And I remember my, my dear friend, Bob, how he would sit there and rub my brother's feet and take care of my brother and even though he had done this to him, he took care and he extended grace to him. And my brother was receiving grace, not only from Jesus, but also from those around him. And it radically transformed his life. There is something so good and so powerful when grace is extended into the lives of other people. That's what Easter is about. That the God of the universe did anything, absolutely anything, and there's no one too broken or too hurt or too far gone or too wounded to not have the capacity to be loved by the God of the universe because it's not about us, it's about what he can do in us. My brother found the grace of Jesus and it changed everything. And I saw it in real time. A brother who I felt like I had given up on finally discovered what was most important. And it wasn't through me, it wasn't from me. It was because he encountered the resurrected Jesus Christ, the savior of the world. And when you encounter him, it changes everything. Church, my, um, I know this is digital and it's kind of weird and it's, I'm in your living room and all that stuff, but I have a question for you that I think is the right question that we should all be answering this Easter. How are you and Jesus? Really? How are you and Jesus? Because here's the truth I want to say to you. If you have grace, if you have the resurrection power in your life, then do everything you can to give it away. Be so generous, care so deeply, love other people. May your neighbors feel the love of Jesus Christ so strongly because grace has been given to you. It's your responsibility and gift is to give it away to others. Be the blessing God intended you to be. If you know the grace of Christ, give it away. May that be your Easter promise this year. But, but some of us, we, we don't know the grace of Christ. Maybe, maybe you've been poking around the edges. Maybe you've been like my brother where you've known lots of things. You've known about God, but you haven't really encountered. You haven't stepped across the line of faith. You haven't engaged at a deeper level. And my encouragement to you is if you don't know grace, do whatever it takes to find and discover grace. Because God wants you, God loves you, God longs for you. God, obviously, this is the story of Easter, would do anything to make sure you could be in relationship with him. That's what Easter is about. It's about celebrating the fact that God committed his life to all creation so that creation could be redone in his glory. God loves you that much. And I thought it would be right as we end our time together that we take a moment and pause in prayer. My prayer for you has been, as I've even been leading up to this Easter moment, is that we together would surrender 
Now, I, I know some of you are, are, are so new to all this. You're like, okay, well, what does that look like? I want to encourage you. If you have been touched by the story of Jesus and, and what you hear you long for, maybe this is your first time, receive his grace. And we're going to pray for that together. But maybe you've been tiptoeing around the edges or you tasted grace just a little bit and you know you need more. Well, this is your time. Let, let's recommit ourselves and really long for grace flooding and filling our lives. Or maybe you're saturated in grace. But here's the good news. It doesn't matter who you are. All of us need grace multiplied in our lives. And so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm simply going to pray a prayer. And as I pray this prayer, I'm going to give you space to be able to respond to the words I use. And my hope is as we pray together this prayer of surrender, that we together would be committing ourselves to the God of all grace and be really saying to Jesus, this resurrection that you did, this defeating of death, this capacity you have to make all things new, I want part of it. Because here, here's the last story I want to say before we jump into that prayer. All of us need forgiveness. One of the coolest things that happened on the cross when Jesus was being tortured is he lifted a prayer to heaven and he said, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Think about that. Jesus is being tortured and killed and he's asking for forgiveness on people. That's the type of God we serve. And I think a lot of us, like my brother, maybe like you, have not come to Christ because you think, oh, no, 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 I can't. I'm not good enough. And here's the good news. No, you're absolutely right. You are not. But Grace isn't about what you're good at. Grace is about what God is good at. And I love the fact that our God is so full of love and grace that he longs for all people to come to himself. So right now, would you pray with me? And as again, as I'm using these words of prayer, I'm simply going to ask you to repeat after me. And then I, I want to conclude with one other thing as, as we close. So pray with me. Heavenly Father, Forgive my sins and set me free. Holy Spirit, empower me to follow you, to show your love. Thank you for new life. You have all of mine. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Church, as we close our digital Easter service today, I want to encourage you uh, with what we're going to be doing. We're going to do two things. First, we're going to sing a song. As we're singing the song, I've talked to some of you and you're like, oh, I don't really like the singing because I can hear myself. Listen, if you need to, turn up the music on your, on your television or on your phone so you don't have to hear you. But don't miss this opportunity to celebrate the goodness of who Jesus is through song. And then after our song is done, Pastor Dan's going to come back and talk about how we can take next steps in our spiritual journey. So I want to encourage you to stay, stay around for that. Thank you for engaging Easter digitally this year. It is a blessing to be your pastor. Mercer Creek, I miss you. God bless.
you pray with me? Jesus, you are our living hope. God, you are our victory. And we praise you for just your work of the cross, the work of, uh, of, of your resurrection, God. Thank you that we can walk in your life. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you said yes to Jesus today, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time and surrendered your life to Christ, we wanna hear from you. We'd love to follow up with you. And so there's a special place that you can go right now. It's mercercreek.org backslash Jesus. And let us know that you made that commitment today. We'd love to follow up with you and help you as you begin this journey of following Jesus. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. We hope that you have uh, been able to worship Jesus. We hope that you've been able to grow closer to Jesus. And we do hope that you come back and join us next week for another online service here at Mercer Creek. Have a great week.